All right, welcome everybody. This video is going to be the chapter 11 lecture and let's dive right in. First issue about chapter 11. Uh, one of the key economics of this whole business is that we have sellers and buyers. They are connected by traders. We'll discuss the traders in just a minute. The main thing you need to remember from your economics class is sellers are the suppliers of the good. They're the ones that can produce the good. You might think about it on the supply side that way. Either way, they have the ability to provide this good. If you meet their selling price, they will give you the good. Below that selling price, they're not going to give you the good at all. So they'll accept that price, so this minimum price, or hurt price, whatever you want to call it, whatever price, this minimum price, they will accept that or any amount above it and in exchange they'll give away the good, okay? So it's important to remember throughout this whole chapter, even at zero above that price, trading the good is worth it to them, okay? That's the zero in our model, right? There might be some price, you know, if it's too low, the seller is just going to hold on to it, or the seller is not even going to bother to produce anything, and so they won't produce it, okay? So that's the seller side. On the buyer side, it's still the same old buyer from economics too. The buyers want a copy of the good below a certain price. So if the price is below a certain amount, the buyers are going to want that good, okay? So that's the demand curve. You might remember from economics, we have this thing called a reserve price. The only weird assumption in this chapter for both buyers and sellers is that the selling price, so what the seller is willing to sell the good for, and the buyer's reserve price are both one price for all. So all sellers have the same base price, all buyers have the same base price. Under conditions of competition, when there's lots of buyers and lots of sellers, that assumption is valid. You also saw already in your exercises situations where it's possible that a buyer might be willing to pay more than other buyers for a good, and it kind of, in some cases, disrupts um, the trading prices, okay? But that's fine. Now, so we had these prices, right? We got the amount that the seller is willing to pay or sorry, the amount that the seller is willing to give up the good for and how much the buyer is willing to pay, sellers, buyers. And the difference in the chapter right now is assumed to be one. That is, there's sort of one amount, you can think of it as a dollar, a euro, whatever you want to call it, whatever one amount is the difference between how much the buyer is willing to pay and how much the sellers are willing to give it up. And it's that one amount, so the one dollar, is what the trader has the potential to profit on, or any of them. Some of them might get more money, any, any others. Okay, we use one in this chapter and it's just to be easy. You can use any positive value. Of course, the amount the buyers are willing to pay should be more than what the sell sellers are willing to give it for. And so whatever that amount is being positive, um, it just, that's, that will work, okay? So this is pure economics. The book makes it sound sometimes like, my goodness, these are strange assumptions, but it's very much a normal economics assumption, okay? From our side, we're discussing social networks. This trading, this intermediary idea is because of network positions. So we have a group of sellers. They have their price they're willing to produce the good for. We have buyers. They have their price that they're willing to consume the good for or take the good for. The sellers can't directly interact with the buyers. The traders are intermediary between the two. We have words for these. They're nice, right? Under situations when there's a monopoly, that is a seller, has an exclusive relationship with a trader or a buyer has an exclusive relationship with a trader, that's a monopoly situation and in that situation the trader is a gatekeeper. 
anytime there's competition or anytime the trader's not a full gatekeeper, then they're just along one of the paths. I have a lovely diagram here showing, you know, we got the S1 and B1. They can only uh, transact basically between you are using trader one as an intermediary. If we removed trader one, S1 and B1 would no longer be able to do anything. They're no longer part of the network. Okay. And you might remember, you know, way back, wow, my goodness, this is from the first chapter we discussed in chapter two, where it's, you know, you take these people out and the network is now no longer a complete graph that it's split off. Okay. So monopoly means you're a gatekeeper as a trader. If you're not a gatekeeper, meaning there's alternative paths around, then that means there's competition and that's where we're analyzing um, the various stuff, okay? A lot of you say, this is not realistic. I'm gonna say this is very, very realistic. Uh, the music industry is very much like this. So way, way back in the day, it used to be if you were a band producing music and you wanted to connect to buyers, there was nowhere to share your or sell your records to, your CDs to whomever, or whatever object you were selling. You couldn't sell them directly to the buyers, at least not very easily. In between, we had the record companies, we had the record music store chains, the distributors, et cetera, et cetera. Those were intermediaries, and so if you were in a music band, in order to make any real money, you had to have an intermediary um, bring you, you know, between you and the buyers. All right. So in the book, they describe this as a two-step game. It's not so important to think about the two different steps um, as much as to think that step two doesn't really matter. So number one issue I want you to remember here is the traders are the actual players. Okay. The buyers and the sellers, they're just like a computer that just accepts whatever bid or ask that they are programmed to accept. So the game here is between the traders. So I've drawn a matrix here that would be, we have a situation where an incumbent trader, trader number one, perhaps won the bid and ask uh, last week with a bid of zero and an ask of one. And now trader two has entered the market and they're ready to formulate their bidding strategy. So this is like a game and we have to remember the players are supposed to know each other or know at least all of the possibilities that are available. And so I've listed here like, okay, I've got trader one here and their possibility is to, you know, they got a new bit, new trader coming in. They'll lower uh, the ask and raise the bid a little bit so they can win. Trader two is thinking, oh, I know I've, I've got the option here of, you know, maybe a little bit lower ask, higher bid, or I can go up even more. So what are we going to do here? Well, we've mapped out whether or not each player wins um, the bid and what their reward would be if they do win it. If we look at trader one, their uh, dominant strategy, their strictly dominant strategy is going to be to bid 0.2 and ask 0.8. Trader two's best response to that strategy is this bid of 0.3 and the ask of 0.7, okay? So in this situation, we're gonna have that where trader one bids 0.2 and ask 0.8 and trader two bids 0.3 and ask 0.7, okay? I just wrote these out, right? You know, I just, you know, I'm just like trader one or trader two. And I'm kind of thinking like, what would the possible options be and um, you know that's how they play out. So that would be the quote step one according to the book. Remember that's the game. The traders are thinking, what is the other player's strategy? What's my reward gonna be? What are they gonna do? And then once the win is in, where trader two picked bid three, ask 0.7, trader one picked bid 0.2, ask 0.8, the sellers and the buyers just take the best. Seller takes the best bid, that's trader two, bid of three, ask of seven. The buyers take the best ask, that's trader two with an ask of seven versus an ask of 0.8. So that's how we know, you know, sort of who won 
uh, the actual game. And so in this situation, Trader 2 is going to win it, and then they're awesome. Okay. All right, so the traders have some assumptions that we have to make sure uh, what's going on with them. The first one is they are maximizing their profits, so they can attempt to trade with a negative profit. So they're never going to ask more than they bid. They're also going to have this assumption that if it does, if they don't get a trade at all, they get zero. And sort of on the flip side of that, if they make a, tra a trade with no profit for zero profit, they do indeed get a little tiny payoff. So it's better to be an active trader than a trader that has no business. Okay. Another key assumption is that the traders have to avoid that situation where they have something on hand and can't sell it or that they sold something without having it on hand. And so what this means is I call it the decision space being narrowed every time. All right, some of the basic stuff here. Um, I'm just going to rewind. This should be straight out of the chapter and you know the idea. So you have the idea of a trading game where there is a monopoly situation. So the trader has a monopoly on the seller in this situation, seller and buyer. The trader is going to bid zero to the seller and ask one from the buyer. Uh, I already told you not to think of it in terms of um, a game, but here they are. Here's a game if it was actually a game. So for the trader, you know, they do have strategies. They can bid zero or one from the seller and the seller has the option to accept or reject it. You can see here that it's strictly dominant for the seller to accept. So in that situation, um, in a way, that's why we're kind of skipping that step too. You would also get it from the buyer side too. But the buyer, their strictly dominant strategy would also be to accept um, whatever in the monopoly situation, whatever the trader offers. So in this situation, it's done, it ends up being best, right, for the trader to get that full, uh, the one profit, okay? Well, now we have competition for a seller. So a new trader comes in, that trader has a buyer. And in this situation, again, we're doing the, you know, now it's the two traders against each other and we had here, you know, the exist, you know, I'm just modeling them out again. This is the bid, um, only on the bid side for the buyer. It doesn't matter if we, you know, we'd have bid zero, uh, ask one, or no, this is on the seller side. So we're bidding from the seller. And anyway, it would be the same as my previous graphs. And you'll see here the trader two dominant strategy is going to be bid one. And the trader um, one best response to that is to also bid one. And therefore, trader one's going to win sort of as the incumbent and get to trade. We don't know. I right, just put that in there as the incumbent wins. So that's that 0.01 minimum um, award. Uh, so again, this is why we're saying under uh, competition, even though we have a monopoly on the buyer already, the competition for the seller is going to eventually mean you're going to end up with a bid, um, a bid of one um, onto that uh, seller. So in this situation, it's kind of interesting here. Yeah, the seller is getting a little extra money. Remember that the seller has this base price and the trader is offering, the traders are offering a little bit more or bidding just a little bit more in exchange for being able to make that trade. Uh, okay, so that was fun. All right, now if there's competition on both ends, so we have competition for the buyer and the competition for the seller, the reason why it's uncertain is that, like with that X thing, is because of that narrowing of the decision space idea we had. Okay, so yes, you might start off with, you know, a bid of zero and an ask of one, and we're just going to end up somewhere in between. Okay. In this situation, I modeled it as a bid 0.5 and an ask of 0.5, but it might end up being a bid of 0.2 and an ask of 0.2. It just depends on how those, um, that decision space sort of evolves. So the number there, that X, is that's the unknown, and it's again because of that decision space.